Hello and welcome to another live Q&A with me, Shekaina. I'm here today to answer all of your burning OET questions. Welcome to all of you joining on YouTube as well as Facebook. And if you're watching the recording later, welcome to you as well. So uh, the format of the session today is really quite simple. I'm here for the next 60 minutes uh, to answer all of your OAT questions. Now that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you um, are completely new to OAT or if you uh, have been um, preparing for some time and are writing your test very soon. Uh, we have the last test uh, of the year coming up this weekend. Um, but you might have a test in January or um, in, in 2024. So um, all of your questions are very welcome. There's no such thing as a silly question. Um, and I will be working my way through uh, the questions that you've got. So uh, all, all you need to do is to type in uh, your question into the comments or um, um, wherever you are on Facebook or on YouTube. And uh, those questions will come through to me and I'll work my way through them. So let's begin. I can see a lot of you already uh, saying hello there. And um, I've got a question here um, that I would like to begin with. So I've got um, the first one from Louisa. Um, and Louisa joins us uh, from on YouTube. Louisa is saying OET uh, part A is uh, difficult. Uh, sometimes um, she feels that medical knowledge is being tested instead of English language. So Louisa, I think you're talking about reading part A. Now, that is um, a challenging part of the test, especially because um, of the time limit that you have, the 15 minutes that you have to answer the 20 questions. But remember that nowhere in the test, uh, medical knowledge is tested. So in reading part A, we're not testing medical knowledge. It's quite simple for you um, uh, to, once you understand how you um, can approach part A, um, it would get easier for you to um, answer the questions and go through um, all of the 20 questions in 15 minutes. So I'm just going to show, um, I'm going to give you um, a few tips here that I've got on um, screen. And um, I'm just going to uh, talk through them um, and hopefully they will help. So with um, part A, it's important to understand um, the context of the task. Remember, it's a task that's going to, just like any other part of the test, it's going to prepare you for the workplace. And in the workplace, what you need to do is um, uh, on a busy day in a ward, uh, for example, you need to find information quickly. So if you're consulting something like a dosage chart or a treatment pathway, you need to be able to find that information quickly. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look um, you're going to understand where to find the information. And that's the first uh, set of questions that you have in reading part A. Uh, they're simple questions that you can um, answer just by looking at the headings and the subheadings. The headings and the subheadings give you an idea of the kind of text you're looking at. So that is a dosage chart, a treatment pathway, as I said, maybe some um, um, presenting factors. It could be any of those kinds of texts that you refer to. Once you've answered those questions, you go to the next set of questions, which um, asks you to find specific information from within any of those texts. Uh, so for example, you could be asked to uh, find uh, the dosage for a medication for a patient of, of a particular age, for example. Um, so you would go to that part of the text and you would locate that information and um, extract that information from there. So it's important to go through the questions in order. Don't use your medical knowledge uh, to answer those questions because all of the answers will be in the texts. Um, so you need to make sure that your answers are only coming from the texts. Um, 
if you follow that, you should get faster at um, answering the questions. Um, as I said, the second tip already, um, use the text features, as I've said, the headings. Um, if you have a table, for example, instead of reading the whole table or starting randomly, look at um, the, the column headings and the row headings. They should help you um, understand what the contents of the table are and such kinds of text features in part A. This, um, the other tip is um, that you check your answers carefully. You need to copy the answer exactly as it is uh, as it appears in the text. Um, so therefore, you need to check that your spelling is 100% accurate. Um, and you don't need to change the word in any way. And then finally, um, of course, it's easy for me to say, don't panic about the time. But um, if you are someone who's struggling with the time, relax a bit and maybe give yourself more time in your practice tests. So start off just by answering the questions with no time limit and then slowly work your way down, reducing the time limit to that uh, 15 minutes so that you become comfortable with answering uh, questions. You become comfortable with, with the technique, with the strategy, and you can answer the questions in 15 minutes. All right. Great, so we've got more questions coming in and um, I'm going to uh, ha um, put up this question from Anu John and Anu joins us on YouTube. Um, Anu is asking, can you please tell me if semicolons are needed in the letter? So Anu, um, like any other punctuation mark, which is full stops, you have commas, um, semicolons, um, you you may need to use them in your letter. So, it, But that really depends on the sentence that you're constructing. So if you've got a long sentence um, where there's, you know, bits of information that you need to give your patient, uh, your reader, uh, then you would need to use, you you may, you may might need to use semicolons. It depends on the sentence. Um, maybe there's a, maybe you could write um, a letter where you don't need semicolons. Um, you write a sentence, sorry, where you don't need semicolons um, in your letter. So it really depends. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, find a really, um, uh, really good blog that we have on this topic, where it talks about uh, semicolons for writing lists, and those lists might be needed in your uh, letter. As I've said, you might have information, long bits of, inf um, lots of information that you need to give your reader. So check out that uh, post there in the chat right now. Uh, that should give you some good examples of why you might need to use semicolons. All right. I've got a question here from Chinu on YouTube. And Chinu is asking, in the writing subtest, are there any assessors from um, a medical background? So Chinu, um, that's um, really a, um, that's a good question. Um, all the assessors are... Um, First of all, let me begin by saying that OET is a test of your English language, not of your medical knowledge. So nowhere in the test do you need to use your medical knowledge to answer the questions. And this includes the speaking and the writing uh, subtests. You don't need any kind of medical knowledge uh, to use that in those tests, in those subtests. Now, the assessors are highly trained. They go through... Um, rigorous training, uh, not just once, but throughout um, the year, throughout their marking, and um, they are language experts. However, like I've said, their training is quite thorough, and they are trained to think like um, a medical professional reading the letter. And what they're looking for is how effective your communication is in that letter. So, um, because um, so the simple answer is no to your um, to your question. Um, you don't need medical knowledge and to to write the test and not just that, but the assessors are uh, highly trained 
um, language experts that uh, have been trained um, to mark your letters. All right, I've got here a question in uh, from Ashikur on YouTube and Ashikur saying, what type of letter is most common? Discharge letter, referral letter or transfer letter? So just to take um, a few steps back, perhaps to look at these three, uh, three letters, um, uh, these are the most common kinds of letters that you um, will find in OET tasks, um, especially for nursing and for medicine. Um, so a discharge letter is basically a letter that a, med a healthcare professional writes to another healthcare professional when a patient has uh, finished treatment at a facility. So for example, you have finished, um, a patient has um, recovered, has had a surge has had surgery and they're going back to the care of their regular doctor so you write a discharge letter at that time um, a referral letter is um, when you um, write a letter to another healthcare professional um, so for example you uh, want to introduce um, a patient to an allied healthcare professional like a dietitian for example or physiotherapist or for example when um, a professional is is uh, giving uh, returning uh, care back to the professional who has uh, referred them so that could be another ref that could be another kind of referral letter and then of course you have the transfer letter so when a patient is moving from one um, medical facility to another or moving locations. Um, they're different kinds, but the common uh, theme or the common thread between all of them is that the reader of the letter is the most important um, focus. Uh, so you write, whether you're writing a discharge letter, a medical um, a transfer letter or a referral letter, you need to keep your reader front of mind. And with that, all of your decisions will um, all of your decisions will revolve around that. So how you select your information, how you organize your information will all hinge on keeping your reader in front of mind. Uh, so therefore, the skill that you really need to write all of these kinds of letters is the same. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put into the chat right now our writing guide, uh, which is a really, um, it's a really wonderful resource that we have there, um, which is basically uh, walking you through all of the um, criteria for the writing subtest and gives you more detailed explanation, lots of examples um about how you can keep your reader front of mind so i'm going to just post that in the chat now and this is the uh, page that will take you to our writing subtest page on our website and if you um scroll down that page you should be able to see the writing guide all right uh libina on facebook asks could you please tell uh, tell uh, me a little bit about articles in listening part a so libina um if you look at our official sample tests and if you've used um official sample tests on our website um you will see in the answer key there that articles are generally optional so um, they are indicated in brackets. Anything in our sample test answer keys, which are in brackets, are optional words. And uh, th that means that um, you, you, it doesn't matter if you include them or not. Okay, so I've got a question here from someone joining us on YouTube. Apologies. Um, not able to read the name but thank you for your question uh, the question is how to improve listening skills beside test practice and listening to podcasts so um um if you some of you have joined us last week for listening week 
uh, you would have seen that we um, uh, covered this very question um, on how you can improve your listening um, skills. So um, I'm just posting the link to the listening week playlist in the chat right now. And that um, playlist um, has uh, five videos um, that we covered, uh, those covered from Monday to uh, Friday. Um, and those videos, um, the, the first of those that was on Monday talks a little bit about more about the skills that you need uh, to improve in your um, listening. So I'm just going to post that in the chat. Do have a look at that, especially the first video on Monday, as I said. All right, some more questions coming through. Um, I've got one from Richard again about reading part A. Uh, Richard joins us on YouTube, and Richard's uh, commenting um, with about with saying that the time allocated for part A is not enough. Um, so, with any part of the test, um, it's preparing you for the workplace and. Reading part A is actually um, a skill that you're going to be using pretty much every single day. And that is uh, finding information, locating information that you need to carry out care very quickly. So if you have, imagine if a patient is in front of you, you're going to, and you need to find some information to continue care. Let's imagine you've got a burns patient in front of you and you need to assess the wound um, and you're going to, perhaps look at uh, presenting factors or maybe even a treatment pathway to, to sort of care for that patient. So at that time, um, you don't have a lot of time to, you know, read. You're going to have to, um, you know, talk to the patient, maintain eye contact with the patient, and then also find the information from, um, uh, from, uh, from the treatment pathway, for example. Um, so that skill is really what reading part A is all about. Um, and it is um, something that um, is, you know, requires um, you to read quickly and efficiently. And that timed pressure um, sort of mimics that, um, that requirement to read efficiently, that situation to read efficiently. So... Um, um, I shared some tips just uh, a short while ago on reading part A. Um, so if you uh, if you're watching the if you watch the recording, uh, Richard, I'd encourage you to look at some of those tips, and they should help uh, with uh, with speed. All right. Um, I've got a question here from Akande, who joins us on YouTube. And Akande is asking, how many marks are needed to get a B in listening and reading? So um, Akande, our advice is generally that you um, aim to get between 30 and 32 when you're practicing with official OET tasks. Um, so I'm going to emphasize official tasks because um, those have been designed in the right way, in the way that the test um, is meant to be designed. If you're using unofficial material um, that you get perhaps on social media uh, and you're not sure of the source, um, then those are not good indicators um, of, you know, of, um, of whether you're on the right track or not with that score range that I've given you. So make sure you're getting official materials. Uh, we've recently posted a new listening uh, sample test on our website. And um, that was part of the listening week that I just uh, shared a little bit about a, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, but do have a look at uh, listening, the listening sample tests on our website. Um, so as I said, between 30 and 32, it's always good, however, to aim higher. So aim to get um, 32 and above. That will really give you uh, the confidence and make you feel comfortable that you are on that uh, sort of um, on the right track to getting a B. I 
I've got a question here from Shamin, who joins us on YouTube. Shamin is asking, are we allowed to underline the relevant words in the writing case notes? So, um, Shamin, yes, you are. You can make notes um, on the case notes. Um, and this is during the writing time. So during the five minute reading time, you're not allowed to uh, mark or do anything, um, not allowed to write at all. Uh, it's only reading time. But after that, yes, you can underline and make notes. All right, I've got a question here from Laura. And Laura joins us uh, on YouTube. Um, Laura's asking, in speaking, if I have to start the conversation uh, with the patient after the examination, and if this is written on the role play card, how can I start the conversation? So Laura, a good way to think about this is um, uh, to think about how you would approach the conversation in real life. So imagine you've just started, you've just examined a patient, um, or perhaps let's imagine a patient has uh, walked into your uh, clinic, you've had a conversation, um, and then you do you perform an examination, say, of their foot. How would you continue a conversation with them after you've examined them in real life? You wouldn't need introductions, um, definitely. And perhaps all you would say is, thank you. Thank you for letting me examine you. And that's how you uh, need to approach the, role, the OET role play. It's in the same way. You can start uh, the conversation by thanking, thank you for letting me examine you, and then um, uh, move on to the task. Um, so, uh, your, in your question, you've also mentioned um, something being written on the role play card, if it is written this way on the role play card, and that is absolutely uh, right. You'll have your setting and your background information on the role play card. And those are the really the two uh, pieces um, that you really need to pay attention to. Because they will tell you whether you know, you've examined the patient, whether you, you're meeting the patient for the first time, or if it's a patient uh, who's returning, for example. Uh, so all of those, um, um, all of those things you'll you'll understand from the background and the setting. All right. Um, I've got a question here from Tina on YouTube, and Tina's asking uh, how to improve listening part C. So Tina, um, I'm going to encourage you to go to the listening week playlist um, and uh, specifically to the listening um, to the session on listening part C. Um, if you're um, if you're someone who would like to um, do the listening week test um, first and then watch the recording, check in your answers against those, you could do those and you will find the listening um, test that was used in listening week on the sample tests page, um, sample test five, you can download that. Uh, go, go through, um, go, go through that all of those questions. So part A, part B, part C, and then come to the video uh, for part C and watch that in the playlist that I've just put up there, um, put up, uh, put in chat. I've got um, some good questions, so I'm looking for some new questions here. Um, got some questions on um, listening. So from Anjana, uh, Anjana is asking, is there a mark? for the article preceding the answer in listening part A. And so Anjana, um, just earlier in the session, um, um, I answered this question about articles being optional. So they're entirely optional, uh, generally speaking. Um, and um, 
I would encourage you to look at the listening um, sample tests, the answer keys of those um, to understand um, how you to see some examples of how um, articles can be optional. Uh, now about your question, um, there is no separate mark for words in your answer. So if you have um, for each question, so each blank in listening party, uh, you have one mark. Uh, you have um, one mark. So it's you don't get separate marks or half marks um, or marks, uh, negative marks. It's if you've if you got that phrase or word that was needed in the blank correctly, you get uh, the mark for it. If it's not correct, obviously you wouldn't get the mark. You won't get half a mark because you included part of the phrase and you left out another one so um, it doesn't work that way with articles um, as i've said they are generally optional um, i've got some um a comment here from rama who joins us on youtube um, so Rama is sharing that they've passed the test um, and wishing everyone the best. Uh, thank you, Rama, for sharing that um, lovely news with us and uh, congratulations to you. Um, Some a question here from Sapna. Uh, Sapna is joining us on YouTube, and Sapna is asking about the warm-up questions. Um, are they important to calculate marks in uh, speaking? So, Sapna, the warm-up section of the role uh, of your speaking subtest is not assessed, so you do not get um, the assessors don't. Um, it's not assessed and um it's just there for you to become comfortable with the uh, interlocutor's voice for each of you to become comfortable with each other's voices and for you to sort of uh, relax a bit before uh, doing your role play so it's not assessed at all I've got a here, question here from Srijana, who joins us on YouTube. And Srijana is asking that um, uh, they have attempted the um, test in October um, uh, with those marks. And could you please tell me if there's any country which accepts three Bs and one C in any module? So Srijana, um, um, it, OET is accepted around the world by different uh, regulatory bodies and medical um, authorities. Um, we don't decide what um, marks are, what scores are accepted. It's the regulator who decides. Um, and so what I would uh, do is encourage you to visit um, the website of um, some of the regulators that um you are thinking of uh, some of your destination um you know some countries that you have in mind as destinations um that you would like to work uh, have a look at their uh, website and um at their requirements and see if that um matches up with um with your scores and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to see if i can um find for you the um, the website where you um, a, a page on our website where you can um, look at all the recognizing organizations and um, um, ha on that page uh, a list of countries with the regulators uh, websites um, linked there. So I'm just going to post that in the chat. Have a look at that. Um, right. 
and I've got a um, question here. got a question here from Moath on YouTube um, and Moath is asking in the su speaking subtest if asked about the name should I um, if I asked about the name should I use it throughout the whole conversation so Moath um, it's um, lovely that you are thinking about using the name of the patient uh, through the con um, throughout the conversation um, that you have. It's definitely important to use the patient's name, but it's important also to remember not to overdo it. Uh, it can come across, um, maybe um, it can come across as quite strange, maybe a bit intimidating as well for the patient. Um, and it's, of course, not natural. It's not something that you would do in real life. And so um, definitely use the patient's name. Um, but use it naturally at certain points. Uh, you don't need to um, overdo it. The assessors are um, um, are not going to. Um, uh, the assessors are going to look at how natural your conversation sounds with um, with your with the interlocutor. So uh, remember not to overdo it. I've got um, some more questions coming in, uh, some really good questions. And um, I've got a question here from another Sapna on YouTube. And uh, Sapna is asking, could you tell me about last minute preparation? So um, by this Sapna, I'm, um, Probably you've got your test coming up on Saturday or, um, you know, you're talking about a very uh, short time of preparation, uh, last minute preparation before your test, maybe a week leading up to your test. Um, so I think one good thing that you could do, a really helpful thing, is to look at um, some of the sample tests that you've done previously and have a look at um, each part and what mistakes you made in terms in the way um, in the sense of what areas uh, do you think you were making mistakes in uh, once you do this um, you can create a personal checklist for yourself of common mistakes that you know you make so areas where you know you might have um, where you trip up um, sort of your weak areas once you've created that checklist, um, you you can be more aware of of these sorts of areas uh, on on test day, and um, and that sh that will help you um, revise and um, be a sort of more prepared. Uh, definitely, one day before the test, um, perhaps not a good idea to do any sort of real preparation. It's a good uh, day to you know, just um, give yourself some mental space to prepare for your test the next day. Make sure you've got all of the things you need for test day. So make sure you've checked, uh, you know, checked your timetable, checked where your venue is, um, how far it is, if you've got, um, if all of that uh, is planned and, um, and make sure if you've got and make sure especially if, that you've carrying all the things that you need to carry especially your id so that's the kind of thing perhaps uh, best to do one day before um, otherwise um, using uh, creating a checklist for yourself a personal checklist um, would be a great way to uh, do some last minute preparation all right um Okay, so I have here I've got a question here from Binu and Binu's um, joined us on Facebook. Binu's asking um, 
are there any changes in the writing assessment criteria so we know there are um, no changes um, so far and none planned uh, for the future so um, there um, so the simple answer is no there, um, there are no changes and none planned uh, for 2024 um, generally speaking though candidates do um, ask this question a lot they love to um, uh, to know uh, if there's any changes or if there's any changes coming up uh, sometimes you might feel that um, you might need to do a test quickly before it changes but that's not the case um, if you would like to sort of stay informed of all sorts of things everything to do with oed uh, whether that's events or you know just um, different kinds of um, information and updates from us um, i would encourage you to create a profile on our website so oet.com go there create a profile and um and uh, you know there's a little tick box you can check there to say that you would like to uh, receive updates from us and those um uh, that's a great way to hear about us and all the different things going on in the world of oet so um no binu no changes um and head over to our website to create a profile. All right. Um, I'm going to pick up this question from got um, question from Aditi on YouTube and Aditi is asking are we allowed to write over the situation card provided during the speaking test so Aditi in your preparation time um, you have three minutes um, in which you can read your card you can make notes um, and so yes you can make any kinds of notes you can underline you can circle um perhaps um you know write little notes to yourself um on on your card so yes you can definitely do that i've got a question here from black sheep on youtube please tell me in short about the format of writing um the format of writing an update letter to a doctor so with the writing test um this is a, a common question we get as well about there being a format so candidates are interested in knowing if there is a format or if there is a, a template that they can follow for uh, writing to a physiotherapist writing to a nurse doing home visits, for example, writing to an update, uh, writing an update letter to a doctor. So, what um, I'd like to emphasize here is that there is no format and there is no template that you should follow when writing your letter. Uh, that see, might seem um, like a little bit of a shock, but uh, to some of you, but um, that is actually. Um, the truth the assessors are looking at your letter um, as as i sort of explained a little bit earlier as an effective they want to know how effective a piece of communication your letter is and uh, that means that on the day uh, when you receive your case notes um, on the test on the day of your test you need to read the case notes and engage with the patient uh, patient story as such um, to understand and understand who you're writing uh, the letter to, to create that effective piece of communication. Um, and that's whether you select in how you select case notes uh, or how you organize your letter. So there is no uh, format. Um, 
uh, the sample tests on our website, for example, are great examples of how the letter could be written, but they're not the only way the letter can be written. There can be different ways the letter can be written. Um, what the assessors are looking at is whether you've met the criteria. And um, I'm just going to post in the chat um, once again, the link to our writing page, uh, which is on our website and um, have a look at the writing marking criteria there. Um, and that should be the guide for you as you prepare um, uh, and think about your letter. Um, so that should be the guide, not a pre-decided template or a pre-decided format. Right. Um, I've got um, a lot of questions here and perhaps a couple of questions that are um, similar. So Tubin asking about percentage and also um, a question from Puneet about percentage again and um, re related to reading part A. So uh, Puneet's question is, if the question is how many percentage or what percentage, um, and the answer is 40%, uh, what should uh, you write? Should you write 40 or should you write 40%? Uh, what I'm going to do is post in the chat for you um, a great video um that explains this really well and um i'm just going to put that in the chat right now um it's a really popular video and it's called uh, how to succeed in reading part a the idea with reading part a is that you do not need to repeat words um from the questions or synonyms of words from the question in your answer. So um, if you think about it, if the question is what percentage, the symbol, uh, the, the percentage symbol actually stands for percent. So therefore you would need to write 40%. Um, I'm just um, looking at what information you've given me there. So you would need to write 40% because um, that is, um, that is the answer there. It's um, what percentage? It's 40%. Uh, the percentage symbol doesn't uh, read as percentage. It reads as percent. So I'm just putting the link um, to the video right now in chat. And I would encourage you to look um, to have um, to watch the video because um, perhaps more than just uh, thinking about individual questions like this that you might have, it will be uh, the video actually explains the reasoning behind why um, you need to be accurate in your answers and how you can be accurate. So it's important to understand the reasoning. Uh, so when you come across any question, you would immediately be able to answer it because you know what uh, what we're looking what the assessors are looking for and why they're looking for that okay so i've got a question here from malak on facebook and malak um, is asking how um, should um, they start OET preparation. So, uh, Mark, that is a good question. I think um, what I can recommend is that you start on the learn pages of the OET website. And um, on the learn page, uh, the learn pages, you will find um, dedicated resources to each subtest, so reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Um, there's some excellent resources there. The writing guide that I shared earlier, we also have a speaking guide. Um, 
you also have guides to reading and each part of the reading and the listening subtests. Um, so a lot of great information there. We also, um, and helpful um, tips, we also have um, um, the study guide, which I will also post in the chat, but I'm just going to post the learn pages there first. Um, for you to have a look at and posting in the study guide. Um, the study guide is a free downloadable resource. Um, it's fillable, so you can you can um, uh, it's sort of you can fill it in as you go along, checking off things that you've done, and um, with these um, you know, with the guides that I've mentioned, the learn pages and the study guides, you've got lots of um, tips and advice and um, a material there for you to prepare. It's also important to keep in mind that uh, along with practice tests and strategies and all of that um, important uh, preparation, you also um, perhaps will need to work on a few language skills um, that will actually help you um, in uh, use those strategies and um, uh, do well in the sample test. So um, also be prepared to understand where um, in terms of general English and English, uh, generally speaking, you need to improve and where um, what you what skills you need to work on. So I'm just going to post in the study guide now. And that is a great resource. So uh, click that link um, and download that to begin. I've got some more um, questions coming in. So I'm scrolling for some recent questions. Um, okay. Some questions about um, types of letters, and that is something that um, I answered a little bit earlier in the session. Um, but definitely, um, like I said, there types of letters um, that are mainly three kinds, uh, mostly, especially for doctors and nurses, but it's the skills that uh, you need to um, become comfortable with that really matter. It's not so much the types of letters there, but the skills. So it doesn't matter what kind of letter you get in your test on test day. If you have those skills that you need, um, you should be able to tackle any kind of letter with confidence. Um, and for that, I've suggested looking at the writing guide. So do go check that out. Right. Um, OK, I've got a question here from Grace. And Grace is asking, in the speaking subtest, do you mention um, your full name or just one of your names. So, um, uh, Grace, if you are, are talking about the um, the um, uh, part of the uh, test where the interlocutor, the warm up section, and the checking of your ID and so on, um, yes, you would you would mention your name um, as it appears on your ID. Um, but if you're talking about the role play itself um, and what you would call the patient, um, then that really depends on the patient um, and their preference. Usually, generally, uh, using the first name is, is fine. Um, so what you would do then is um, you could do one, um, you could 
for example, one thing you could do is in your preparation time, ask the interlocutor what they would, um, what their name would be in the role play, and you could use that name um, throughout the role play. You could um, also assume a name and start that way, um, or and especially if you're uh, meeting a patient for the first time as a part of the introduction. Um, introductions, you would ask the patient their name and perhaps how they would like to be addressed um, in the role play. Okay. Okay, I've got um, a question here from Swapna, and Swapna saying in the writing subtest, if it's mentioned as family's local nurse or family's GP, is this type of letter known or unknown? So Swapna, I would um, encourage you to um, perhaps look a bit further than just those terms that appear in your writing task, for example. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is, of course, read the writing task, but also uh, read the, understand the case notes as a whole, um, especially in in the last sections of the case notes um, where you have, um, you know, discharge information, for example, and other notes that those, uh, that section also will tell you a lot about whether the patient and the reader are familiar with each other if they, if they know they have an existing relationship. So read the case notes in their entirety um, to make, and especially those um, sections there, uh, to make a judgment about whether the reader and the patient have an existing relationship um, instead of looking at just those terms. Um, and also, uh, it's also good to remember that um, official case notes are um, uh, official case notes will always make this existing relationship clear. So if you're working with official case notes, there, should, there will be no shadow. There will be no doubt in your mind. Um, you, you will be left with no doubt about the relationship. Um, they'll always make that clear. A lot of um, good questions about writing and types of um, letters in OET. So I am going to post in um, to chat a lovely blog article um, about the three main types of letters in the uh, writing subtest. And as I've said earlier, um, it's important to not focus so much on the type of letter. Of course, that is that'll give you an idea of um, you know what kind of uh, that'll give you some idea. But it's also more important. It's more important to focus on the skills um, and meeting the assessment criteria. So um, check the link out in the chat about the three main kinds of letters, and also have a look at the. Um, um, writing guide. Um, the link to the writing guide also appears at the end of that blog article. Okay. All right. So I've got a question here from Lucknus um, on. Uh, from fa on Facebook and Lucknus is asking in the listening subtests, what can I do if the conversation between the physician and the patient diverts and they start discussing other things? Should I stop writing or wait? Um, uh, should I stop writing uh, or should I wait? Um, 
uh, do I need to listen while writing if I've, if I've got that question correctly? So I think what you're asking, Lakhness, is um, in a recording, uh, audio recording, um, if the conversation diverts and you've got your um, you've got your questions in front of you um, and the conversation doesn't um, has has diverted to something else so what i would encourage you to do is really to check if those tests that you are using and practicing with are official tests in official materials you um this sort of a situation won't occur um the materials are designed <clears throat> so that the conversation lasts about five minutes and during that five minutes um you will see on the um, notes, so the question paper of listening part A, you will see there's headings, there's uh, sometimes subheadings, and then you have complete notes, and then you also have uncompleted notes. And those uncompleted bits, the blanks, are what you need to fill in. Um, the notes themselves will give you the structure of the conversation, generally, and um, they are a good guide to help you find your place in the recording. Um, and so that obviously means that all of the five minutes are accounted for in those notes. You'll, um, you won't find um, they're um, going off topic or discussing other things. Uh, they're going to be very, very close to the notes. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is to check if the materials you're using are official tasks. Um, if they aren't, then that means um, if they aren't, Official tasks, um, you know, stop using them because they can mislead you about the test. Um, so they might get you, you might end up practicing things or doing things that aren't really part of the uh, of the test. And um, that could really set you up um, sort of for some surprises and shocks on test day. So um, what I'm going to do is post in the chat again the listening sample tests page and um, have a look at this listening sample tests there those are official tests um, i would also encourage you to visit our oet store where you can um, purchase some additional materials um, there is our listening skills course so i'm going to post in the chat a link to the listening skills course which was um which was which is a uh, uh, sort of a new course that we've uh, developed and it has some excellent uh, practice material there some excellent um, uh, um genuine resources that you can um, use to practice with so i'm just looking for that link now and We'll just put that in there, in the chat. This is the listening skills course, and it is on our, uh, it's in our store. All right. So with that, we've come to the end of this um, Q and A session, the last one of twenty twenty three. Um, it's been a pleasure answering all of your questions and we're going to be uh, coming back in january with another um, q a live and all of 2024 um, i would just like to take this time to wish um, all of you a very um, a safe and happy festive season if you are uh, celebrating if you're taking time off if you're not um, but perhaps you're looking forward to some time off later. Um, I wish you as well um, um, a good and um, safe uh, festive uh, time um, and uh, hope that you would get some time to recharge and refresh uh, for the new year ahead. Um, so wishing all of you a happy new year and uh, we will see you in a, a, a live Q&A very soon in January.
Bye for now.